Let's take a moment, let's have uh, a word of prayer, and we'll get into our message for today. Father, your love is so deep and so rich, and it's poured out in so many ways. It's so evident when we look in the lives of the young people who are here with us, and our children and grandchildren are such a wonderful, powerful reminder of the way that you've entrusted us, and the responsibility you've placed upon our shoulders. What a wonderful thing it is to allow us to understand and agree with your terms of faith, and to provide an example, a path that's clearly defined in your word, and our faithfulness helps to light the way for them. I pray that you would bless our efforts. We're so thankful for the blessing and the, the hope that we have in these who uh, have been presented this morning in terms of, of their achievements. We pray that you'd continue to guide as we offer um, a modeling and as we offer instruction so that in all things, the faith can be evident in their life as well. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us in this way. May this service provide you with honor. May our availability to your word provide you with the proper place of authority and leading in our life may it be evidenced in all we do and we pray in the name of Jesus amen we're continuing this morning in the series dealing with the life and the account of this young woman named Esther for the last few weeks we've been talking about the significance of the faith Esther has had and some of the challenges that have been placed before her today we're going to look at another very big challenge that was placed before her and we're going to anchor this just as we did before in the model that's being given her in the life of her older cousin this man named Mordecai before we get into the text in the book of Esther, I want to remind you of Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 10, where he sends out this appeal to his disciples. Matthew 10, 16, Behold, Jesus said, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. Now, this is very important in terms of a reminder for us because we live in a culture which challenges Christian values. We live in a time, not so far removed from others, because there have been challenges in the past, but certainly we live in a time which seems to be counter to God's expectations of righteousness and any uh, norm that God has established, it seems the world challenges. We should be discerning. We should have insight enough with our Christian faith to determine exactly what honors God and what does not. Now, fortunately, we don't have to go about this blindly. We have the testimony of Scripture, which provides for us clear direction. And so we use the Bible as a guide for us. We continually offer prayers to the Lord to help to supply us with the insight necessary to make proper choices and decisions that will honor Him and be in keeping with His will. This is a powerful reminder from the Word of Jesus that we should develop this type of dis, uh, discernment or insight so that we'll not be found naive in this culture being shrewd as serpents and yet innocent as doves now with that in mind let's go to the book of Esther again the Old Testament book of Esther as I said contains only 10 short chapters but the account of Esther in her life just bears out so much and, and is so relevant with our uh, culture today in Esther chapter 3 last week we were talking about some significant things that occurred with a plot against the king and we talked about how Mordecai revealed um, actually to Esther this plot Esther the queen went to the king and said there are these men who are plotting to assassinate you the king paid attention to this and she did this in Mordecai's name and the Bible said that when the investigation was carried out it was determined to be true and the men responsible were hung and it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles, the Gallo um, library that was, was um, removed from the king, available still. He could call for books or parchments and things, but it was kind of somewhat removed from his memory. It was recorded and then pushed away. Well, now we come to Esther chapter 3, verse 5 and following. And we know of this man named Haman who has risen in the ranks with the king to have a sense of authority. In Esther 3, beginning with verse 5, the Bible said, When Haman saw, following the king's decree that everybody recognized Haman, when Haman saw Mordecai neither bowed down nor paid homage to him, Haman was filled with rage. 
But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. For he had told him who the people of Mordecai were. Therefore, uh, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, who were throughout the whole kingdom of King Ahasuerus. Now, this is a big deal. Reminding you of what we talked about last week, we understand the king has placed Haman in a position of authority and he has, as such, told, he's decreed to the people, when you see Haman, you are seeing a representative of me, someone who is on my behalf representing or speaking, so pay him correct respect. Now, we did the whole backstory with Haman and his family lineage, and we, what we learned last week was the reality that the people of Haman were actually the ones who went against God's people when they were going into the land of promise before they got to Sinai, and they fought against them, and as a result, God made a pledge. He said, I will war against this family for generations. And so now this man who had a deep hatred of God's people in this particular foreign kingdom now where they are in exile has now risen in the ranks to a position of authority and Mordecai has to respect and honor this except Mordecai out of conviction for his faith chooses not to do so. This example that Mordecai said in our text last week and that's being reminded of uh, today is a powerful example for us. It's a man who held great convictions. He would not recognize someone who sought the destruction of God's people and warred against God's plan, someone who is vile. And he was doing this at personal risk and actually at the risk of exposing many other Jewish people who really should not have been recognizing Haman either. In other words, Mordecai's faith was so significant, his character and integrity so strong, he would not bend the knee, he would not surrender his faith for sake of convenience. Boy, what a challenge for all of us here today. Because the culture, they do this, don't they? Well, if you just give a little over here, it's no big deal. And how many of the people, how many of the Jewish people, Mordecai's people, had been bending the knee and recognizing Haman, thinking, well, I have to do this to get along. There comes a point, and Mordecai drew the line. There comes a point when we have to say, we can no longer do these things just for sake of getting along. We must honor God at all cost. This was Mordecai's determination. Now, it doesn't stop there because as we see, Haman has now become offended. His pride has been injured because Mordecai would not recognize him. So he devises this plot. The scripture we just read, Esther 3, 5 and following, the Bible tells us Haman didn't want to just grab Mordecai. He was so enraged, he wanted to completely destroy the entire Jewish people. And so that's what he sets out to do. He's secretly devising this plan, and he has his advisors come. And the Bible goes into the detail to say that they were casting lots. He was looking for some source to help him plot. This is not a righteous man, and he's looking at all manner of influences all around him to try and come up with the, uh, the greatest uh, plan he can. He's devising in the best way he can a plan that will destroy the people. Well, in Esther chapter 3, beginning with verse 8, it tells us of this plan. Esther 3, 8 and following. Haman said, now to the king, to King Ahasuerus, there's a certain people. Now we can... No, in parentheses, this is speaking entirely of the Jewish people, the people of Mordecai. There's a certain people scattered and dispersed among the peoples in the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of all other people, and they do not observe the king's laws, so it is not in the king's interest to let them remain. If it is pleasing to the king, let it be decreed they be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who carry on the king's business to put out, or put rather, into the king's treasuries. Then the king removed his signet and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews, 
The king then said to Haman, The silver is yours, the people also, to do with them as you please. Now this seems rather ancient and brutal. And it's hard for us, you know, with our age of sophistication, our age of intellect and our, our, our learning, it's hard for us to imagine what a brutal type of environment this must be that someone would go for the entire destruction of a whole group of people. And yet, just in October, we saw an action similar to this, didn't we, in Israel. Now, that was specific to the Jewish people. And we saw a horrific, violent, anti-God group, a cult, a blood cult group, who did everything they could possibly do to come into Israel. They ended up killing well over 1,200 innocent people, carrying many off. So it's not so far removed in terms of brutality. Listen, this world is a broken, fallen, evil world. And the hearts of men have not changed they devise ways of evil in keeping with their particular ideas or ideologies. Whatever they find convenient to themselves or of benefit to themselves, and they will mow over or destroy anyone who gets in their way. And we can kind of see that just from the modern news lines and the, the current ongoing struggle that's happening now with the people of Israel and, and uh, the, the terrorist group Hamas. But, you know, we don't really even have to go so far removed from that particular environment to see that the same idea, perhaps more passively, more palatably, is being carried out in general against Christian teaching. Just not so many weeks ago, we've seen some dramatic changes happening within some mainstream Christian denominational groups and their embrace of things that are completely outside Scripture. We've seen culturally some things that have come against a lot of Christian values and we've seen people actually saying to hold to what, what's been known for so long as, as basic biblical virtues and basic biblical values is barbaric. Such that marriage now in the modern age under the cultural definitions here in America has been redefined the idea, the norm of general things like biology has now been radically changed in the eyes of the culture and the expectation is if you do not agree, if you do not march in line with these things, if you don't even uh, promote them, you are somehow brutal and they are doing everything they can to silence that type of view. Perhaps you were watching just this past week, only a few days removed, at a small Catholic college, an otherwise unknown NFL kicker got up and gave a small speech to a closed environment. As a Catholic, he was referencing a graduating class of a Catholic college, and he was promoting, as bold as it might seem, the out-of-touch idea that guys and girls get married and have children. And he was presenting this, as odd as it might seem, as though that were a virtuous thing that could benefit the culture or that it would be something God would honor. And the news media lost their ever-loving minds over it because he's so out of touch and he's so anti-women. How sad. So we don't have to turn the pages back very far in our own culture to see that in an environment like this, that there are many Hamans who are devising their plans and they are saying there's a certain people, in the account of Esther, it was the Jewish people who held to the values God had presented. In our modern times, it's those who have the audacity to hold to traditional values or Christian biblical values. We're among the certain people now. It's interesting, the king heard this and was moved enough that he removed the symbol of authority that gave Haman actually the legitimate power. He removed his signet ring and gave it to him, and effectively in saying, you can do what you want. 
the, the money is yours. I'm not worried about the money. Take care of this so there's not a problem in the kingdom. So the plot has been devised. Now, rather than two men plotting to assassinate the king, now we have this man, Haman, who is actually being so bold that he wants to completely destroy an entire group of people. We call this genocide in our culture today. So he sends out an edict, an official pronouncement with the king's authority throughout the entire kingdom, all the providences, all the people groups, every region, every governing authority, everyone would know that on a certain specific day, they were to go against the Jews and they were to utterly destroy all of them, every man, woman, and child. Now, you may remember last week we talked about this. This is precisely what God had commanded Saul to do against the Amalekites. He didn't do it. And that's what caused, it, to some degree, this uprising of people who have come from the Amalekites who now are being represented by this man, Haman. In Esther chapter 3, verse 12 and following, the king's scribes were summoned on the 13th day of the first month, and it was written just as Haman commanded to the king's satraps, to the governors who were over each province, and to the princes of each people, each province according to its script, each people according to its language, being written in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed with the king's signet ring. Letters were sent by couriers to all the provinces of the king to destroy, to kill and annihilate the Jews, both young and old, women and children, in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to seize their possessions as plunder. A copy of the edict to be issued as law in every province was published to all the peoples so that they would be ready. For this day, the couriers went out impelled by the king's command while the decree was issued at the citadel in Susa. And while the king of Haman sat down to drink, the city of Susa was in confusion. The king and Haman in their leisure now, sensing they've done everything that's necessary. Haman's handling the business. It won't be a problem. And these people who are warring against me silently, who are working behind the scenes, they're going to be taken care of. And the king has has no recognition of the value of life and his solution is to just utterly destroy. And we can kind of relate to that. And this is a cautionary tale played out over and over again multiple times throughout the history of mankind. It's not the only time in this particular event, this particular occasion. Now you can imagine what it must be like because remember, the queen is a Jew. Queen Esther is a Jew. And the king doesn't know that. And in that culture, in that time, when the king sent out an edict and he officially sealed it with his signet ring, it was law and it could not be changed even by the king. So you can imagine the gravity of the circumstance. So here's what happens now. We advance to Esther chapter 4. And the Bible tells us of the great turmoil that's created for Mordecai now. He knows the decree. He's in a position where he's around and he sees and hears what's being told. He knows the edict. He knows he and his people will be destroyed. He's troubled by this and he's openly mourning and the Bible says Esther sent word to him, basically to urge him to be, it'll be okay, it'll be all right. Her idea is it won't happen the way you're thinking, it'll be okay. Perhaps even to some degree she's thinking maybe some will die, but that's the cost and everything will work out. So in Esther chapter 4, beginning with verse 10, Scripture says, Esther then speaking to Hathak, ordered him to reply to Mordecai, all the king's servants and the people of the king's province know that for any man or woman who comes to the king, King, to the inner court who is not summoned he has but one law and that is he be put to death unless the king holds out to him the golden scepter so he might live I have not been summoned to the king for these 30 days they related Esther's words to Mordecai what has happened here is Mordecai not receiving comfort from Esther sent back word to her and said you must speak to the king on behalf of the Jewish people she said, can't do it. 
Can't go before him, unsolicited, unrequested. I'm his wife, but the protocol does not allow this. He has to summon me, and I've not been summoned for 30 days. Not going to happen. <laughs> Further, if I go, it's a death sentence. Listen to what happened. Mordecai then told them to reply to Esther, Do not imagine that in the king's palace you can escape any more than all the Jews. He's reminding her of who she is. She's under the same death sentence. He continues, For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, and you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. Boy, talk about, talk about coming home talk about self-examination or review of faith and action it's really being made evident to Esther now she's had some time in the palace and there's been peace with the people Haman is now stirred he's upset he wants to kill all the Jewish people in the kingdom and Mordecai said Esther you got to go to the king you got to tell him and now Esther's saying I can't do it and Esther said, but if you don't, God will deliver regardless, however it happens. If you don't, you will be guilty of a sin, and you and your family will, you'll be no more. But who knows, perhaps God has placed you here in this time, in this place, with this position, just for this. Now let me ask you, as we see the craziness of the culture stirring around us, who among us perhaps can be in the same position as Esther? Who among, among us, hearing the challenge of Mordecai, recognizes, if I don't stand now, am I really standing in faith and faithfulness before my God? Who among us, like Esther, perhaps is placed in a unique position at a unique timing for just a time like this? And now, the challenge is not an easy one, and it's not one that comes without cost. There is definitely risk that's involved here. Here's what happens in this particular event. Esther decides, I will go before the king. She comes into the general presence of the king. The king acknowledges her, points the scepter, allows her to approach him, and he asks her, why are you troubled? What request would you have of me? And she, uh, she says, uh, in, in just a short while, she's going to have a meeting with the king in a wonderful place, in a place that allows also Haman to be present, and her plan is to expose Haman. Meanwhile, the Bible says that something had been troubling the mind of King Ahasuerus. He was unable to sleep. Scripture tells us he had been up, and so he chose, perhaps, to have, on one hand, some would argue, an opportunity to study so that he can learn more from history and be a better leader. On the other hand, some have suggested he wanted the most boring thing he could have in his presence so he'd fall asleep. So he summoned to his people, bring me the Chronicles. <laughs> bring me the Book of Records. And they were reading it before the king. And guess what came up in the reading? The Bible says it was the account of Mordecai exposing these two men who were going to kill the king earlier. And the king had apparently forgotten. And he stopped the reader. And he asked the question, what has been done? What is recorded? What reward did Mordecai receive for such a great thing in sparing my life? And they looked in the records and nothing was recorded as a recognition or a reward for Mordecai. And the king said, this is not right. So he called in Haman. Esther now, chapter 6, verses 1 and following. So during the night, the king could not sleep, gave the order to bring the book of records, the chronicles, so they could be read before the king. It was written, Mordecai had reported Bigtha and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, who were doorkeepers, that they had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. The king said, what honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? The king's servants who attended him said, nothing has been done for him. So he calls Haman. And in calling Haman, he said, generally speaking to him, what reward should be offered a man 
who would be such a benefit and such a blessing to the king. Now Haman in his ego is thinking, oh, the king likes me a lot. And I have devised this plan to devastate it, to annihilate the Jewish people. And now the king is giving me this great honor. So he said to him, I want you to take a, king, a horse that the king has ridden on and robes which you have worn. Adorn such a man with your robes. Place him on this horse and let him be paraded before all the people with someone heralding on his behalf saying, such is what the king does for the one who the king finds delight in. Haman's thinking, I'm going to wear a robe that belongs to the king, and I'm going to ride the, horses, uh, the horse that belongs to the king. Oh, this is going to be great. So he devises this great big thing, and the king says, <laughs> go and do exactly what you've said with Mordecai. He said, verse 10, the king said to Haman, take quickly the robes and the horse as you've said, and do so for Mordecai the Jew. Can you imagine Here's Haman <laughs> in the presence thinking, oh, the king's going to, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live large for a while. People are going to know I'm it. And the king said, ah, do this for Mordecai, the man he hates more than anything. Do this for Mordecai the Jew who is sitting at the king's gate. Do not fall short in anything you have said. So Haman took the robes and the horse. He arrayed Mordecai, led him on the horse back through the city square, and Haman himself proclaiming, Thus it shall be done to the man whom the king desires to honor. Mordecai then returned to the king's gate, but Haman hurried home mourning with his head covered. There is a biblical teaching at play here that should be recognized in this account. First of all, Haman was entrusted to a place of service. But Haman was using it, leveraging it for his own benefit. He neglected his God-given call. You know, the Bible even tells us God, God designed and set in place government. And they are an agent of, they are a servant of the people. Haman forgot this. Secondly, it's important for us to recognize that God's expectations didn't change. He wasn't moving for anybody. This is powerful for us to recognize with Haman, but it's even more powerful for us to recognize with Queen Esther. Esther was not immune. She also was vulnerable. She also was in a position of service. And Esther did the right thing and rose at her own cost, a personal risk to meet the needs of the people. God's expectations did not change. Haman didn't respond correctly. Esther did. Lastly, it's important for us to recognize that God will honor. God will give recognition for those who have served him well. Perhaps it won't be in the means or the way we would expect. Maybe it won't be with a robe riding the king's horse. But as I said last week, God never forgets. He remembered what Mordecai did and he honored him and it was to Haman's humiliation. Now, let me remind you of something written in the book of Proverbs so we can keep in mind and keep in proper context and perspective God's expectation of our sense of humility, keeping our pride in check. Proverbs 16, 17 and following says this. Oops, I went too far. The highway of the upright is to depart from evil. He who watches his life, or his way rather, preserves his life. So a cautionary thing there. Do not fall into the pit of wickedness and evil. Follow the righteous course. Goes further. Pride goes before destruction. A haughty heart or haughty, haughty spirit before stumbling. It's better to be humble in spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. What can we take home from this? Mordecai clearly had done the right thing in modeling for Esther. And now further in this place of threat, Mordecai had to remind Esther she was there to serve. Her identity and her faith couldn't be removed. And further, whether she did the right thing or not, God was not going to be moved. God was going to do what was necessary to spare his people. Esther had the choice, do I obey and do the right thing even at cost in honoring God 
or do I choose to step back and allow it just to happen? Esther made the right choice. I want to make sure that we understand the biblical term here, right is always right. Wrong will never be right. There may not be a convenient season to be righteous. But you know what? God hasn't called us to convenience, has he? Jesus himself spoke of the cross we must bear if we follow him. There are times when we, like Mordecai, when we, like Esther, must draw the line and say, I will go no further. I will honor God in this circumstance, come what may. It's a powerful reminder for us a story that very much is relevant to our terms and our times today. And I pray you, like me, being reminded of the example of Esther and Mordecai, that we can hold firm to God's expectations and not fail. Let's pray together this morning. Father, we thank you so very much for the clarity of your word, your scriptures, and your expectations. They're so clear, so simple to understand and to obey our choice is what you allow us to, to be able to make ourselves. You don't force or coerce yourself upon us. You give us the opportunity to agree and to cooperate or not. We have, for some, a season of decision. We have an opportunity placed before us to examine whether our faith is one which will be evidenced in our obedience or if we will do the convenient thing, even at great cost. May you bless us, Father, so that we can in all things honor you at whatever cost is necessary so that you will be honored and praised and you will accomplish your will. Guide and direct us. Thank you for allowing us the example of Esther and Mordecai. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.